over the last few weeks, we've been in our new series entitled Bridge Builders. And so far, we've taken a look at using the Bible as our blueprint and, and opening our spiritual toolbox to see that we have the right tools, that we're growing in the fruit of the Spirit. And it's a process that we take a look at here. You see, rebuilding is a key component to bridging the gap and mending those relationships in your life that need extra work. And as Jesus reminds us, the harvest is ripe. We look at the news, we see things, we look at our own lives, and we realize that there are people that are divided. There's a great chasm there, maybe in our own relationship, but with God as well. And we must be people of action and intentionality. Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker, two names that uh, resonate as they were preachers, and they had churches in London in the 19th century. And on one occasion, Parker commented on the poor condition of children admitted to Spurgeon's orphanage. It was reported to Spurgeon, however, that Parker had criticized the orphanage itself. In reality, that wasn't what took place. So Spurgeon blasted Parker the next week from the pulpit, and the attack was printed in the newspaper and became the talk of the town. So people flocked to Parker's church the next Sunday to hear the rebuttal. <laughs> that kind of interesting. <laughs> He says, I understand that Dr. Spurgeon is not in his pulpit today, and this is the Sunday they used to take an offering for the orphanage. I suggest we take up a love offering here instead. And the crowd was delighted, and the ushers had to empty the collection plates three times. Later that week, there was a knock on Parker's study. And it was Spurgeon. You know, Parker, he says, you have practiced grace on me. You have given me not what I deserved. You have given me what I needed. It's a powerful story of action. Another powerful story of, of building a bridge rather than digging a deeper and wider chasm. Pastor Parker could have so easily further divided that chasm and caving into the cultural pressure around him. And yet he did not. He chose the way of grace and compassion. He went above and beyond. You've probably heard it said, it takes two people for an argument. You ever have somebody that chooses not to argue? You know? In the words of Spurgeon himself, he says, You have given me not what I deserve. You have given me what I need. We read a portion from Luke chapter 15, and that's where we'll be today. But let me follow, get leading up to the story. But Luke 15, 11 through 16, if you want to look in your Bibles or in your, 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 your uh, phones, Jesus continued, it says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. In this opening section of the what we call the prodigal son, we see the foundation of our conflict forming. The decision that the prodigal son made led to turmoil, led to problems, not only for himself, but also for his family. Isn't it true? Decisions 
that we make can feel good for a moment, but in the end, as we will see and have maybe experience, we will lead to heartache, not only for yourself, but also for those around you. And like Spurgeon, his decision to attack Parker became the entire town's problem, or at least their interest. Huh. Spurgeon could have chosen differently how to use his pulpit, his gift, his possession that God gave him. Isaiah 53, 6 perfectly outlines this for us. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, sin becomes universal. Not one of us. Sin is never a privatized and isolated matter. All of us have experienced sin. And when I sin, there's a ripple effect that travels much further than I or you can even know. Actions mean something, and they have a ripple effect. Now, that goes two ways, doesn't it? It can have a negative influence, or it can have a positive influence. It's about building that bridge, building that chasm. Think about it sometime. You have the opportunity to determine what's going to happen. Consider yourself with two buckets. In one bucket, it's water, and in the other one, it's kerosene. And so you come along a fire, somebody that disagrees with you or some difficult situation, you choose the bucket. Which bucket are you going to use? The water or the kerosene? And I think you understand the difference that the water will make and the difference that the kerosene makes. But that's what we're confronted with. We have that opportunity. That's our possession, if you will. And in the ancient world, this son most likely would have been in his teens, a little bit older maybe. He was a single young man. And as a younger son, he would have received half of whatever the elder received, about a third of his father's estate. And the verb that we see in waste of possession means to to scatter or disperse something similar to the prodigal son, Jesus gives you and I an opportunity to use the gifts that were given. We have those. <coughs> and given the tools and instructions, we have a choice to either build a bridge and mend relationships, or we can waste our possessions and end up, if you will, feeding pigs, longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. <coughs> Excuse me. Could you imagine being in that situation? The term prodigal is translated to describe a, a debased or extravagant lifestyle, something that doesn't need to be. The prodigal son chose to waste his possessions on himself, and he ended up broke, alone, and doing things that in the Jewish culture were unclean, according to the law of Moses. For a Jewish person to be around pigs, something that was unclean. <clears throat> you and I have similar choices to make with the gifts that we've been given. We can use them for good, to build up the family of God, but we can also use them for ourselves. We can squander them on things that don't matter, things that won't last. And so we really have to ask ourselves, are we wasting our possessions? Are you wasting your possessions? Are you squandering the good that God has freely given you? Is it time to consider a different path, a different use for the gifts that you've been given? And I believe that one of those gifts are being in control of how we handle conflict. We have to make a choice to become a bridge builder. You see, it's time for a rebuild, if you will. We all have a little prodigal in us. Some of us are blessed maybe with a profession or with money or with gifts of, of singing or athletics, musical talent, whatever that might be. But we waste the gifting on things that please us. It could simply be the, the praise of others. It could be money. It could be a title. It could be a career. 
And there's not a shortage of temptation in this life, is there? But temptation is common to all of us. And all of us veer off the path from time to time. We understand what it is to be a prodigal at times. Romans 3.23 reminds us that we, what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, period. That's how it is. And with this in mind, let's turn our attention back to Luke chapter 15, if you will, verses 17 through 21, what we're going to call the rebuild, if you will. Luke 7, 15, 17 starts, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You know, I love the way Luke says, but when he came to himself or when he came to his senses, that aha moment came to him all of a sudden where he woke up and said, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. The prodigal son realized that while certain things he thought were what he wanted and what he needed, and yet they only lasted for a moment, and that life with his father was actually good and right. You remember at some point in time of your life that all of a sudden your parents got a whole lot smarter. You remember that time? Hmm, now I understand why they said this. Or they said that. We learned that sometimes we weren't ready to accept it and use it in our lives. But we need to do that so many times. And then, what does the son decide to do? He decides to return and try to make things right. It's kind of interesting to think about it. He rehearsed privately to himself that how he would publicly apologize to his father. And in many ways, the prodigal son gives us an example of repentance and confession. He quite literally turns from his ways, and he moves back to the Father. He moves back to righteousness. And as we become a great bridge builder, there may be mistakes that we do and make that can cause damage. And it's important.